The posture of meditation. Bring the mind home. But our minds are so wild and distracted that we need a skillful means and some special methods. Posture is one of the skillful means. The posture I'm going to explain to you may differ slightly from others you may be used to. It comes from the ancient teachings of the Great Perfection. In the teachings of the Great Perfection, it's said that your view, your insight into the nature of mind, can be expressed through the inspiration of the posture. The posture of the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas in the Ten Directions is the same, but their mudras are different, representing their different aspirations. Sit as if you were a mountain, with all the unshakable, steadfast majesty of a mountain. A mountain is completely natural and at ease with itself. However strong the winds that batter it, however thick the dark clouds that swirl around its peak. Sitting like a mountain, let your mind rise and fly and soar. The most essential point of this posture is to keep the back straight. The key is to keep the waist straight. Our spine has a natural S-curve, and we should maintain this natural curve. The waist should be slightly concave, and the back slightly convex, which is a natural curve. To be as straight as an arrow means to be vertical, and as steady as a mountain. The inner energy will then flow easily through the subtle channels of the body. Because by sitting in this way, the body relaxes and the mind will find its true state of rest. Don't force anything. The lower part of the spine has a natural curve. It should be relaxed but upright. Your head should be balanced comfortably on your neck. It's your shoulders and the upper part of your torso that carry the strength and grace of the posture. Both shoulders should be relaxed, but not too slack. There is a difference between being relaxed and being slack. Extend your arms slightly, which can carry the strength and grace of the posture. Maintain balance in your posture, but without any tension. Sit with your legs crossed. It would be better if you can sit in full lotus or half lotus posture. The crossed legs express the unity of life and death, good and bad, skillful means and wisdom, masculine and feminine principles. Samsara and Nirvana, the humour of non-duality. If you have leg problems, you may also choose to sit on a chair with your legs naturally hanging down and relaxed, but be sure always to keep your back straight. In our tradition of meditation, your eyes should be kept open. This is a very important point. If you are sensitive to disturbances from outside, when you begin to practice you may find it helpful to close your eyes for a while. Close your eyes slightly, but not completely. Let your eyelids droop naturally, leaving a small gap for light to pass through, and look inward quietly. Try it yourself and you will find that your mind naturally turns inward. Once you feel established and calm, gradually open your eyes 
and you will find your gaze has grown more peaceful and tranquil. Now look downwards, along the line of your nose, at an angle of about 45 degrees in front of you. One practical tip in general is that whenever your mind is wild, it's best to lower your gaze. When distracted or excited, lower your gaze and tilt your head slightly downward. Whenever you are dull and sleepy, bring the gaze up. Slightly lift your chest and tilt your head upwards to bring your gaze up. Once your mind is calm and the clarity of insight begins to arise, you will feel free to bring your gaze up, opening your eyes more and looking into the space directly in front of you. This is the gaze recommended in the practice of the great perfection. Gazing at the space, at this point there is no self, no phenomena, no knowledge or views in the mind, not even the view of the great perfection. Then merge with the space of the Dharma realm. This practice uses the external emptiness and luminosity to inspire the mind to merge with our Buddha nature, which is luminous in essence. By nature, there is no self, no phenomena. The luminosity and emptiness can help inspire our innate Buddha nature because luminosity and emptiness are the inherent characteristics of wisdom. Use emptiness and luminosity to inspire the mind to merge with our true nature. In the teachings of the Great Perfection, it is said that your meditation and your gaze should be like the vast expanse of a great ocean. Gazing at the space, the mind will become boundless. Not like the ocean, but like the space, all-pervading, open and limitless. This is the mind of the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas as Dharmakaya is all-pervasive by nature. When your mind and Dharmakaya merge as one, your true nature naturally appears. Just as your view and posture are inseparable, so your meditation inspires your gaze, and they now merge as one. This practice is a preparation for practicing the great perfection. First, lower your gaze, then gradually lift it up, and finally turn your eyes upwards and gaze at the space. The eyes are the doors of the luminosity. The heart center is connected to the eyes through wisdom channels. Our eyes are open, and the whole space is within our field of vision. But don't gaze at anything or anyone. Our eyes are open, like a mirror, reflecting every object and every person in the hall. But we don't gaze at anyone or anything in particular. As practitioners, our minds are also like this. Your mind and your eyes are connected. As your mind grows broader, your vision becomes wider. Your mind becomes more and more spacious and pervasive. You will discover now that your vision becomes more expansive and that there is more peace and equanimity in your mind. This is the way of practice. Don't gaze at anything in particular. When an ordinary being is attached to something or someone, whether out of greed or anger, 
His eyes are fixed on that thing or that person. When we meditate, don't focus on anything in particular. Instead, turn back into yourself slightly and let your gaze expand. When you are not attached to anything, you naturally have a broad vision. Why is Avalokiteshvara called thousand-eyed? It's not that he has a thousand physical eyes, but his mind is all-pervasive, illuminating everywhere. Using figurative language, we say that he has a thousand or even ten thousand eyes. There are several reasons for keeping the eyes open. First, you are less likely to fall asleep. Second, meditation is not a means of running away from the world. Third, it's not disconnecting from the world and entering a trance-like state of consciousness. Closing the eyes can easily lead to trance and immersion in your own dark state. On the contrary, meditation is a direct way to help us truly understand ourselves and relate to life and the world. Your eyes are the key to connecting your life to the external world. Therefore, when meditating, keep your eyes open, not closed. Slowly, we learn to open our eyes and look at everything peacefully, without rejection or attachment. Don't reject life. Stay open-minded and be fine with whatever comes your way. When you see anyone or anything, always be compassionate and wish them to attain bliss, liberation and freedom. When you see anyone, you should aspire like this. You leave all your senses just open, naturally, as they are, without covering them up or grasping after their perceptions. Whatever you see or hear, don't chase or dislike it. Practice like this. It's not easy. Ordinary beings are always attached to what they see or hear and are constantly disturbed by afflictions. At the beginning, we can only practice with easier objects. This also applies to ears. Listen to any sound naturally. At first, we may get upset over some noises, but we can visualize them as mantras to deal with our afflictions. If we change our mindset, we will find that this visualization can actually help open our energy channels. The key is our mindset. We need to practice to be open and natural without grasping after perceptions. When encountering perceptions, we tend to pursue the suffering of change while rejecting the suffering of suffering. This is our instinctive reaction. This is hard. It's not easy to deal with our instincts from beginningless time. We can only gradually deal with them. Eating can be the suffering of change or the suffering of suffering. It depends. For example, some people enjoy eating spicy food while others consider it as the suffering of suffering. Even for the same person, he may enjoy eating mildly spicy food while suffer from eating very spicy food. It depends. A few days ago in Chengdu, I saw someone eating very spicy peppers that we dare not eat, and he enjoyed it very much. So whether it's the suffering of change or the suffering of suffering is uncertain. Everyone's physical condition is different, and their instinctive reactions can vary greatly. 
as Dajjama Rinpoche said, though different forms are perceived, they are in essence empty. They are just appearances like illusions and dreams. In reality, they are empty of inherent existence. However, the appearances in life are three-dimensional, but even three-dimensional illusions are still illusions. Being three-dimensional doesn't mean it's not an illusion. However, only through meditation, visualisation and training can we deal with it. Yet in the emptiness, you can perceive various forms. Though we can hear different sounds, they are also empty, without intrinsic nature. The so-called hearing a sound, as we know, is the sound produced by our ear consciousness, not external sound. We have learned the mind-only school. We also have various thoughts, which are mainly categorised into three aggregates, perception, mental formation and consciousness. The thoughts are also empty of intrinsic nature. Whatever you see, whatever you hear, whatever you think, leave it as it is, without grasping. Leave the hearing in the hearing. Leave the seeing in the seeing without letting your attachment enter into the perception. Our practice is to eliminate attachments here, and the key is to understand emptiness and have the wisdom of emptiness. When you realise that something is empty, your attachment to it naturally disappears. Meditating on emptiness is to eliminate our attachment to existence. However, when you are eliminating your attachment to existence, don't be too attached to emptiness, as it will lead to the extreme of emptiness. Ordinary beings are attached to existence, while hearers and solitary realizers are attached to emptiness. Therefore, when we are eliminating our attachment to existence, we cannot be attached to emptiness as well.